Hello, in today's EKG video, I'll be discussing how to distinguish VT from SVT with a barren C, both of which are general categories of wide complex tachycardia. Distinguishing between them is important as they often require different treatments, both acutely and long-term, and they carry different degrees of urgency. The first thing to discuss is to unpack that phrase SVT with a barren C. What exactly does that mean? First, in this context, SVT refers to any supraventricular tachycardia, that is any tachycardia originating from above the ventricles, including sinus tachycardia. Second, in this context, aberrancy refers to any cause of a wide QRS complex other than a ventricular origin of the rhythm. This includes bundle branch blocks, accessory pathways such as that seen in Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, effects from antiarrhythmics such as sodium channel blockers, and electrolyte disorders such as severe hyperkalemia. Although it should be noted that differentiating VT from a regular SVT in the presence of an accessory pathway is often not possible in the absence of a baseline EKG. Both of these definitions for SVT and aberrancy are broader than are typically used in other contexts. Next, I'll run through a list of some EKG features highly suggestive of VT. You may remember the importance of AV dissociation. AV dissociation refers to the situation in which the atria and the ventricles are both beating entirely independently of one another, in which P waves and QRS complexes are occurring at different rates and are out of phase. Consider this strip. At first glance, it's a regular tachycardia in which the QRS complex is not particularly wide, it's actually just at 120 milliseconds, which is the most commonly considered upper limit of normal. Because of the fact that it's sitting right at the threshold between narrow complex and wide complex tachycardia, you might be inclined to say this might be SVT with aberrancy. However, if you look for atrial activity, you might notice something unusual. For example, there is what looks to be a single isolated P wave here that's not repeated elsewhere in the strip. If that's all that was here, you might wonder, eh, maybe this is artifact, some little electrical noise, or the patient briefly moved, and this doesn't represent cardiac electrical activity at all. But keep looking, and you'll see this bump here at the end of the T wave. And this T wave here looks a little bit taller than the others, which could be superimposed atrial activity. And there is a little bump on the end of the QRS complex here and at the beginning of this one. If we speculate that this is dissociated, regularly occurring atrial activity, then we can map out where the other hidden P waves should be, and we find that they are occurring in places that are unlikely to be seen because of the simultaneous electrical activity in the ventricles. In this case, the PP interval is about 440 milliseconds, which corresponds to a sinus rate of 136 beats per minute. Since the QRS complexes are also occurring at regular intervals, but not in sync with the P waves, we have AV dissociation. Unlike most of the other things that will be added to this list, AV dissociation doesn't highly suggest VT, it's more or less diagnostic of VT by itself with profoundly rare exceptions. Next on the list are capture and fusion beats. These are unexpectedly narrow and normal looking beats or near normal looking beats within the middle of a run of regularly occurring wide complexes. This is due to a supraventricular impulse passing through the AV node and reaching the ventricles just before they would otherwise be depolarized by the surrounding ventricular tachycardia. When the QRS complex is completely normal, it's called a capture beat. When it's a hybrid of QRSs from a ventricular and a supraventricular origin, because the supraventricular impulse reaches the ventricles at the same time as they are being depolarized from the VT, that's called a fusion beat. While capture and fusion beats are particularly suggestive of VT, they can rarely be seen in SVT with aberrancy. For example, if a patient has an SVT with a pre-existing left bundle branch block and a PVC, or a premature ventricular contraction occurs within the left ventricle 
at the exact moment that the right ventricle is depolarized from the normally working right bundle branch, it can result in a single unexpectedly normal looking QRS. Another feature is a particularly long QRS duration, above 160 milliseconds as a rough cutoff. There is also something called concordance in the precordial leads. Concordance means that among leads V1 through V6, all of them are either fully upright or fully downgoing. Here's an example of both concordance in V1 through V6 and extreme QRS prolongation. Two more features are an extreme QRS axis, also known as a right superior axis, between positive 180 and positive 270 degrees, as well as a finding sometimes described as R greater than R prime in V1, or more colloquially, a taller left so-called rabbit ear. Here's what these look like. First, the extreme axis is demonstrated by negative or downgoing QRS complexes in both 1 and AVF. Regarding the rabbit ear, look at V1 and see how there is a left-sided peak to the R wave with a notch or shoulder on the right. While an RS R prime complex or rabbit ears in V1 are a typical feature seen in right bundle branch block, in that case, the right rabbit ear is taller. When the left rabbit ear is taller, it's suggestive of VT. Two final features are Brugada sign and Josephson sign, both of which are demonstrated here. Brugada sign is when the time from the onset of the QRS complex to the nadir of the S wave, known as the R to S duration, is over 100 milliseconds. Josephson sign is notching on the downslope of the S wave near its nadir in V1 or V2. There have been attempts to create criteria that improve on the positive and negative likelihood ratios of the individual findings. The most well-known is the Brugada criteria. These criteria say that if any of the following four findings are present in a wide complex tachycardia, the tachycardia is likely VT. AV dissociation, a lack of an RS complex in all precordial leads, which is a slightly confusing way of saying the EKG displays concordance, an R to S interval of over 100 milliseconds, or Brugada sign, in any precordial lead, and the fourth is much more complicated if at least one morphology criteria for VT is present in both V1 or V2 and in V6. The specific morphology criteria depends on whether the QRS complex in V1 is upright or downgoing, often oversimplified as a right bundle branch block versus a left bundle branch block pattern. Now, perhaps if reading EKGs was the most common clinical task a person did in their profession, these morphology criteria would be internalized and become second nature, but I have yet to meet a practicing clinician, including cardiologists, who have memorized these, which is why, despite frequent mention in EKG learning resources, the Brugada criteria are not commonly used in practice. In an attempt to both improve on the test characteristics as well as improve on usability, several alternative algorithms have been proposed, including the Varechii and AVR algorithms, as well as the lead to R-wave peak time criterion. These all rely heavily on an assessment of how sharp the initial QRS deflection is, in which a sharper deflection suggests that the Purkinje fiber network is being used to initiate the complex, suggesting a supraventricular origin. However, none have gained wider acceptance than Brugada. One additional algorithm was proposed in 2022 called the Basel algorithm, named after the Swiss university from which many of its authors hail. VT is likely present if at least two of the following three criteria are met. A high-risk clinical feature, which is defined as either a history of MI, a history of heart failure with an EF under 35%, or history of an ICD. And in lead 2 and in lead AVR, a time to first peak of more than 40 milliseconds. That term, time to first peak, refers to the duration of time from the onset of the QRS complex to the moment that the waveform first changes direction.
and that's irrespective of the overall morphology of the QRS. In a validation cohort, the sensitivity and specificity of the Basel algorithm was 93 and 90% respectively, and the median time to diagnosis, which was measured in the study, was 38 seconds, compared to nearly 2 minutes for Brugada. In short, it combines the accuracy of Brugada with the speed of the later algorithms. I suspect that over the next few years, this will become the predominant algorithm used for distinguishing VT from SVT with aberrancy. Importantly, none of these algorithms can be applied in the presence of most accessory pathways. This is because most accessory pathways directly connect the atria to the ventricles, bypassing the AV node, and thus can insert anywhere into the ventricular myocardium, mimicking VT arising from that specific spot. Although there has been a proposed system for distinguishing VT from pre-excited SVTs, it is generally accepted that this cannot currently be done reliably. The ACC, AHA, and European Society of Cardiology included a simplified algorithm for distinguishing VT from SVT with aberrancy in 2003 joint guidelines for the management of SVTs. Their algorithm as published is a bit clumsy, for lack of a better term. This is my attempt to clean it up a bit. First, if a wide complex tachycardia is irregular, it's probably SVT with aberrancy, specifically AFib, A flutter with variable block, or MAT. If the tachycardia is regular, one should next ask if the QRS is identical to that while the patient is in sinus rhythm, provided that a baseline EKG is available. If the wide QRS is the same as when in sinus rhythm, this is indicative of SVT with aberrancy. One thing to keep in mind here is that during antidromic AVRT, a reentry circuit in which the impulse travels down the accessory pathway and back up the His bundle and AV node, the QRS complex can be wider than it is during sinus rhythm, but otherwise the polarity of each lead's QRS complexes can be relatively similar. If the QRS is not identical to that when in sinus rhythm, examine the A to V ratio meaning the ratio of P waves to QRS complexes. If there are more P waves, the patient has SVT with aberrancy, specifically either atrial tachycardia or atrial flutter with fixed block. If there are more QRS complexes than P waves, the patient must have AV dissociation and thus VT. On the other hand, if there is a one-to-one -one relationship between P waves and QRS complexes, or it's unknown because there is no visible atrial activity, look at the QRS morphology once again. If it's typical of a classic left or right bundle branch block, then it's probable SVT with aberrancy. If the morphology is anything other than a classic bundle branch block, then it's probably VT. Another consideration is to identify what immediately preceded the onset of the arrhythmia. If the arrhythmia seem to be triggered by a premature atrial contraction, it's probable SVT with aberrancy. If it was preceded by what appears to be a sinus P wave or no P wave at all, that's probably VT. One final consideration, though arguably the most important, is not on the EKG at all, but is rather the patient. Five clinical features that are suggestive that a wide complex tachycardia is VT age over 35, a history of ischemic heart disease or prior MI, the presence of left ventricular hypertrophy, any cardiomyopathy, or family history of sudden cardiac death, which suggests the possibility of a genetic arrhythmogenic syndrome, such as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, long QT syndrome, or Brugada syndrome, not to be confused with the Brugada criteria. I'll conclude by pointing out that it is a far worse mistake to treat VT as SVT than it is to treat SVT as VT. Therefore, if you are not completely sure which of the two you're dealing with, treat it as if it were VT. For example, erring on the side of urgent or emergent DC cardioversion.